Uh, now, uh, Mariam is here uh, with the business news, which will be dominated by this Bank of England uh, report, uh, and that is suggesting, we'll, we'll hear from Mark Carney shortly, but it's suggesting that a disorderly Brexit would trigger the worst recession, uh, worse than financial crisis uh, of 10 years ago. Yes, yeah, so Bank of uh, the report suggests that a deal, uh, a de Brexit with no deal and no transition period, which... Uh, you know, has been touted as a possibility if this withdrawal agreement is not agreed to, would deliver a severe economic shock to the economy, triggering a recession worse than the one we saw in the financial crisis of 2008. And the economy shrinking, according to the bank, by 8%. It also says that house prices will fall by 30%, commercial property prices, which are even more important for businesses, by 48%. It's predicting unemployment nearly doubling and the value of the pound falling by a quarter. Of course, that would mean that then goods that we import into this country uh, would become more expensive and that in turn would mean that we'd see higher inflation and they're predicting inflation of, of around six and a half percent and that would be very difficult for consumers quite right. frankly. Well, yeah and now I'm just looking at the press association the Bank of England is warning that the pound would crash inflation will soar mm -hmm. interest rates would have to rise in the event of a no deal disorderly Brexit. Uh, they're just walking in but we've got I, we should preface this with we, Mark Carney has sparked concerns before, hasn't he? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. let's just hear from him. Let's hear exactly what he's got to say. Mark Carney, the Bank of England Governor. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Bank's Financial Stability Report press conference. On my left is Sam Woods, the Deputy Governor for Prudential Regulation. On my far right is Ben Broadbent, the Deputy Governor for Monetary Policy. Next to Ben is John Cunliffe, the Deputy Governor for Financial Stability. And on my immediate right is the Governor, Mark Carney. Thank you, Gareth. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. The Bank of England's job is to promote um, the good of the people of the United Kingdom by maintaining monetary and financial stability. That means low, stable, and predictable inflation. And it means resilient and reliable financial system that's there for UK households and businesses in good times as well as bad. The bank focuses on the necessities of price and financial stability so that people can focus on what matters most to them, such as buying a house, saving for education or retirement, or starting a business. And the single most important determinant at present of the UK economic outlook is the nature and timing of Brexit. Since the referendum, the bank has done everything we can to ensure we're ready for Brexit, whatever form it takes. As today's stress tests reveal, the core of our financial system is strong. Major banks have capital ratios three and a half times higher than before the financial crisis. We've worked closely with the UK government, other UK authorities, and European partners to manage possible risks of disruption to the financial system. And most fundamentally, our institutional framework is robust. The bank has clear objectives, operational independence, all the necessary tools, and the resolve to deliver our monetary and financial stability remits. So consistent with those remits, the bank is publishing two documents today. The first is our latest financial stability report, which details the important current risk to UK financial stability, and they run beyond Brexit. Um, but it also includes our latest stress tests of major UK banks. And secondly, our response to the House of Commons Treasury Committee's request for analysis of how Brexit will affect the bank's ability to deliver our, our objectives. Specifically, the TSC requested that the bank focus on the consequences of a potential economic partnership with the EU and a no-deal, no-transition Brexit scenario. And let me begin by stressing what these analyses are and what they are not. These are scenarios, not forecasts. They illustrate what could happen, not necessarily what's most likely to happen. Building scenarios requires making assumptions about the form of the new relationship between the UK and the EU, the degree of preparedness across firms in critical infrastructure, and the response of macroeconomic policies. The scenarios are calculated for the policy-relevant timelines for the bank, that is, up to five years, and as such, they're not assessments of the relative long-term merits of different trading relationships. The, scenari the scenarios are, however, informative about the relative economic impacts of various economic relationships and the transitions to them. Taken together, the scenarios highlight that the impact of Brexit will depend on the direction, magnitude, and speed of the effect of reduced openness on the, EU on the UK economy. 
The direction of the effects of a reduction in openness is clear. Lower supply capacity, weaker demand, a lower exchange rate, and higher inflation. The magnitude of these economic impacts is modeled using established empirical relationships and it's disciplined by the bank's suite of macroeconomic models to ensure their coherence and plausibility. But the speed of adjustment is less clear, given the lack of precedence of reduced openness, particularly amongst advanced economies. So the worst case scenarios assume that adjustment to deintegration happens more rapidly than it has over the past decades to integration. This assumption is grounded by cross-checks, including econometric models, case studies, and intelligence from the bank's agents across the United Kingdom. The MPC and the FPC have reviewed the relevant scenarios, and they will use them as inputs in their policy deliberations. So let me turn to a few key observations, starting with the economic partnership. These scenarios reflect government policy and are most relevant for the MPC. They show the sensitivities to key elements of the new partnership yet to be negotiated, such as the extent of customs and regulatory checks, the degree of non-tariff barriers to services trade, and the breadth of equivalence determinations for financial services. In the five years under the partnership scenarios, GDP is between one and a quarter percent and three and three quarters percent lower than it would have been if the economy had continued growing at its May 2016 trend rate. Relative to the bank's most recent forecast in November, inflation is lower in the near term in both scenarios given the appreciation in sterling. It rises as the transition period ends due to the fading effects of that appreciation and in the less close partnership scenario as custom barriers take effect from 2021. A mechanical model of monetary policy generates a gently rising path for bank rate over the scenario. This should not be taken as a prediction of the actual path for bank rates, which will depend in practice on the balance of effects of demand, supply, and the exchange rate. Turning to no deal and no transition Brexit, there are a range of possible outcomes in the event of that, consistent but consistent with the FPC's remit a remit to protect and enhance the resilient resilience of the UK financial system to major shocks, the FPC has focused on two variants labeled disruptive and disorderly, which are underpinned by worst case, worst case assumptions. In both scenarios, tariffs and other trade barriers are introduced suddenly next spring. The UK recognizes EU product standards, but the EU does not reciprocate. In the more severe or disorderly scenario, the UK's border infrastructure does not cope smoothly with new customs requirements for some time. There is a pronounced increase in the return investors' demand for holding sterling assets. By the end of 2023, GDP is more than 10 percent lower in the disorderly scenario compared to that May 2016 trend. Despite this sharp contraction in GDP, something that's bigger than the, happened during the financial crisis, unemployment rises to 7.5% less than during the financial crisis, and that reflects the supply-driven nature of the downturn. The sharp fall in sterling, alongside with the imposition of tariffs, pushes up the cost of imports, and overall CPI inflation peaks at 6.6%. In line with its remit, the MPC does what's necessary to achieve its inflation target, with bank rate rising sharply to 5.5% in a disorderly scenario, although again I'll remind you that that is a mechanical calculation. The FPC has assessed the resilience of the financial system to these worst case outcomes, and its key findings are, first, based on comparison with the 2018 stress tests that were released today, the FPC judges that the UK banking system is strong enough to continue to serve UK households and businesses even in the event of a disorderly Brexit. So even after that unlikely event, we calculate the major UK banks will still have capital ratios around three times higher than they had before the financial crisis. And I'd ask you to recall that the bank stress test released today is two and a half times more severe than the Brexit scenario, worst case Brexit scenario I just described. That is what being prepared for all eventualities 
requires. Secondly, major UK banks have ample liquidity to withstand a major market disruption. They hold more than one trillion pounds of high-quality high liquid assets and can access an additional 300 billion pounds of liquidity through the Bank of England's regular facilities. Major UK banks can now withstand many months without access to wholesale or foreign exchange markets. And thirdly, the FPC has worked with other authorities to ensure most risks of disruption to cross-border financial services have been addressed. And in this regard, two main actions remain. Further UK legislation, currently in train, will need to be passed for a fully and, fully and functioning legal and regulatory framework for financial services to be in place ahead of Brexit. And the European Commission needs to provide uh, greater clarity to reduce disruption risks in derivative markets following their recent and welcome statements. Finally, the Bank of England, with other authorities, has put extensive contingency plans in place to support institutional resilience and market functioning during any period of heightened uncertainty, as we did around the 2016 referendum. We're closely monitoring market developments. We can lend in all major currencies, and if required, the FPC stands ready to cut the counter-cyclical capital buffer if economic stresses were to materialize. Now, the bank's ability to achieve its monetary and financial stability objectives also depends on, a on both the transition and the end state. The level of preparedness of businesses and infrastructure, infrastructure such as ports, custom systems, and transportation operations, will be important determinants of how well the economy adjusts to new trade barriers. Evidence from surveys and other UK authorities suggests that the country is not yet fully prepared for a cliff-edge Brexit. Surveys suggest that less than half of businesses have initiated contingency plans for no deal, and less than a fifth of small businesses have done so. Up to a quarter of a million traders have never completed a customs declaration. 11 of 12 major projects to replace key border systems are at risk of not being delivered by March 29, 2019. Securing an implementation period will minimize the impacts on the UK economy. And a sober objective assessment of the appropriate length of that implementation period is desirable to get Brexit off to the right start. This implementation period should be as long as necessary to prepare properly for new trading relationships, but no longer. Turning to the end state, as you know, the UK is home to the world's leading international financial centre. At around 10 times GDP by asset size, the scale of activity of the UK financial system and its complexity is unmatched in other jurisdictions. This confers a special responsibility on the bank to ensure that that system is robust to a wide range of potential domestic and global shocks. That's why, irrespective of the particular form of the UK's future relationship with the EU and consistent with its statutory responsibility, the Bank of England will remain committed to the implementation of robust prudential standards in the UK. This will require maintaining a level of resilience that's at least as great as currently planned, which itself exceeds that required by international baseline standards. It will also require maintaining more generally the UK authority's ability to manage UK financial stability risks. So to conclude, the Bank of England is ready for Brexit, whatever form it takes. The analysis released today confirms that the core of the UK financial system is resilient to worst case Brexit scenarios. We have contingency plans in place to support market functioning if necessary. But to be clear, the bank being ready for Brexit is not sufficient to guarantee a particular economic outcome. There's little monetary policy can do to offset the potentially significant hits to productivity and supply that Brexit could entail. Our unwavering commitments to price and financial stability will support the necessary adjustment of that real economy. But the future potential of this economy and its implications for jobs, real wages and wealth are not in the gift of central bankers. Rather, the economic consequences of Brexit over the longer term will depend on the nature of the UK's future trading relationship 
on other government policies, and ultimately on the ingenuity and enterprise of the British people. And with that, uh, my colleagues and I would be pleased to take your questions. Thanks. Okay. As always, <clears throat> if you could please give your name and also the organization you represent, and please stick to just one question the first time around. Um, so I'll start with Adam and then Son. Adam Parsons from Sky News. Uh, Governor, the, t the, uh, the bankers today presented a, a picture of a no-deal disorderly Brexit that would lead to one of the biggest economic slumps in the recent history of this country. So are you part of Project Fear or do you really think that we are looking at economic catastrophe? No, um, thanks for your question, Adam. I would be absolutely clear. Um, our job is not to hope for the best, but to prepare for the worst. And as uh, I think we make clear in the report, as I hope I made clear in my opening statement, um, we uh, have looked at a potential no deal, no transition Brexit um, and made uh, a series of worst case assumptions around that. So for example, that port infrastructure is not ready, uh, for example, that uh, the EU does not recognize, there's no grandfathering of UK product standards and on. They're detailed uh, quite extensively. And also that uh, there's quite a sharp reaction in financial markets. The reason we do that is to be prepared for all eventualities. Um, it's to make sure that our banks have more than enough and at three times what they had even after that shock, more than three times than what they had going into the financial crisis, they have more than enough capital uh, for a disorderly Brexit, to make sure that they have more than enough liquidity um, and that as a whole the way they're managing risks and the protections that they have from capital and liquidity mean they can continue to serve uh, businesses and households across the United Kingdom. So we look at that in order to be prepared for that worst case scenario for a purpose and the thing that I would underscore, and one of the things buried in an avalanche of paper that came out today, both the reports but also um, uh, the uh, minutes uh, that will come out, the record which will come out in 10 days from now, will unredact a series of discussions that the FPC and analyses the FPC has been doing for the last couple of years which is exactly looking at exactly these types of scenarios and making sure that we're getting the financial system ready for something which is an unlikely scenario. Um, and even in that unlikely scenario, we've taken it to the, what we think is the worst case version of that unlikely scenario to make sure that we've done our job, we've got the system ready. And what we're telling you, and if there's one thing you take from the avalanche of paper and the numbers and the discussion today is that the core of the UK financial system is ready for Brexit, whatever form it takes. You, from what comes through in your report, you say that the Bank of England is ready, the financial system is ready for Brexit, but Britain is not ready for Brexit. And there seems to be a lot in your report that's saying part of the severity of some of these outcomes is to do with the unpreparedness of business, of households, whatever, for what's ahead. Could you unpack that a little bit? How much is that to do with the severity of some of these situations? Yeah. Well, again, I'll underscore uh, particularly, in, because this is all relevant to no deal, no transition, and obviously we've looked at um, uh, the economic uh, forms of economic partnership uh, where there is a transition um, and there is a smooth transition. Um, so in the case of no transition and, w and again with our worst case hat or visor on um, as you'd expect us to be, um, there are several drivers of those outcomes. It starts with the frictions of, um, of the trading system um, uh, because all of a sudden there are not just tariffs in place, but there are rules of origin checks, a series of customs and other checks for which the system is not yet prepared. Um, and so that adds on top of it additional frictions. Um, and then we have very, and we've laid all this out very clearly, I, I think, um, there are uh, uh, risk premia that come into financial markets at the same time in part relatedly because of uh, the scale of the economic shock and the degree of unpreparedness um, and uncertainty effects which hit business. 
Um, to take it back to the core of your question, which is, so what's actually happening on the ground? Um, it is our observation, and it has been for some time, um, that uh, the number of business or the proportion of businesses that have contingency plans or who have initiated contingency plans or who have activated uh, contingency plans uh, remains a fraction of businesses as a whole. Um, as you dig deeper into that and you have conversations with business and go at me, in, in several cases it is very difficult uh, for those businesses um, to plan for border frictions. They can plan for tariffs, they can plan for a change in the price of selling their goods, but in terms of the logistics of uh, making that happen is very difficult. I heard an uh, example on, uh, on your program this morning it, it, you know, of a very sophisticated business which has that issue. That's a very common, uh, that's a very common phenomenon. So uh, let's flip it around though. Uh, the situation is that uh, the European Union, uh, the United Kingdom, uh, uh, certainly the United Kingdom government, um, wants a transition period to whatever form of Brexit we're taking. Um, and, um, and certainly from what we have seen for the economy as a whole, it is advisable to have that transition period, that implementation period. And if I may, it, this, this should be an objective assessment of preparedness and the time it will take um, to ensure that not just for businesses, and I, I, I go back to the point that in some cases the logistical issues, you can't plan for these logistical, you can't plan around them. Um, so it goes uh, first and foremost to making sure that the infrastructure is there and ready and ready to go so that we can move as seamlessly as possible uh, to the new relationship, whatever form it takes. Okay, uh, Joe and then Ben in front. Uh, yeah, Joel Hills from ITV News. All, all of your scenarios assume that Britain ends up leaving the European Union in some way, shape or form. What would happen to your growth forecasts if Britain ended up remaining? Um, well, we, weren't, um, we were asked by the Treasury Committee, and I'm sure we'll discuss it with them next week, um, to compare those scenarios that I just went through, that you referenced, um, to, so, quote, unquote, the present position. Um, which is a slightly ambiguous phrase, um, and we, you could be, from our perspective, you could interpret it in two ways. Uh, the first is the present position, in other words, the current forecast that we have for the economy, uh, which has an element of Brexit in it, obviously, because uh, there has been an effect, as you know, Joel, on business investment uh, because of uncertainty over Brexit. There's a, the pound is where it is because of uh, Brexit effects as well. So you can interpret it first as that, but you could also interpret it um, as um, a scenario where uh, we are part, we remain part of the European Union. Um, and uh, the cleanest, the simplest approach to that for us is to take the last forecast we had prior to the referendum, um, and as you'll see in the documents, is there is a straight line called May 2016 tre trend, um, which is just an extrapolation of the path that the economy is on. It's nothing more, to be absolutely clear, than a mechanical extrapolation of the trend rate of growth of the, that the economy was on, which is around 2% uh, at that time. Um, and then one, and it's done throughout the document, you can compare scenarios, and I appreciate you're using the word, scenarios, not forecast, but these scenarios, whether it's no deal or partnership, relative to either the forecast we just came out with as the MPC or that, uh, that previous trend, and you can make your own assessment from that. So, Richard, just to sorry, interpret that, sorry. Um, we'll come, if we come back to you, Joel, on the second go, if we, if we yeah. get time for second ones. Um, can we go to Ben at the front and then Lucy alongside? Yeah. Uh, ben Chu from The Independent. Governor, you uh, this avalanche of documents mentioned several times that there's no historical precedent for a disorderly Brexit. There's yep. nothing to guide us from the history books. Um, given that, what is the scientific basis for saying, as you have several times, that this is the worst case scenario that you've painted yep. here? Doesn't it, uh, dire as it is, doesn't that give us a sort of false sense of precision about what we're looking at here? Yeah. Why don't I, I'll start and then I'll, I'll, I'll pass to Ben. Um, 
Obviously, you know, one could take the most extreme move in credit spreads, the most extreme move in uncertainty, um, uh, the, uh, the most extreme moves in border frictions and, and add all those up. Uh, we're pretty, pretty close to that. We're not precisely at that, but we're pretty uh, close to that uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of what we've done. Um, what is one of the most important things, and I just want to stress this, though, in thinking about the dynamics here, um, are how quickly does the economy respond to um, the sharp decrease in openness? And it's a sharp reduction in openness uh, in the disorderly scenario, not just because of tariffs and non-tariff barriers, but because of lo you know, logistical problems, uh, other factors. With that sharp reduction, um, we have made an assumption, and it's grounded in some case studies and some work, but it is, we're very clear about this, this is an uncertainty. We've made an assumption that the adjustment is pulled forward. In other words, the adjustment of the economy is more rapid when you put up barriers than the adjustment of the economy than when you drop barriers in terms of a new trading agreement. Um, and, we, and that adds a degree of difficulty, uh, challenge, it makes it worse the scenario worse. And so what I'd suggest, what we would suggest rather, is that, you know, we take, we move to these, you know, fairly sharp moves, two standard deviation moves, for example, on uncertainty, plus you have this dynamic that's brought in. It's, it's, it's justified, but it's, we do it in order to have a worse uh, case scenario. But Ben, do you want to? Yeah, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> excuse me. We do have a, a lot of information, and by we, I mean the community of economists on the effect of differing trading relationships on where volumes of trade end up and what those do to productivity. You're right that in general, in terms of the changes in those things, they tended to go in a positive direction. Uh, certainly in developed economies, more or less continually since the Second World War. And we've not had the, the reverse experience. Uh, so one important assumption we make is that the magnitude of the, these effects is the same in reverse as it has been on the way up, as it were. I think that's a reasonable assumption to have made. Um, what is harder to judge, and this is what the governor was talking about both in the opening statement and just now, is the speed at which those effects come through. We think there are several good reasons to imagine that they will come through faster, certainly in the most disruptive cases. Um, there is one case study we've used on uh, the loss of access on the same terms to the UK by New Zealand in the mid-1970s. It's about the only concrete example we can find. We think there are independently good reasons for that, some of them related to the state of preparedness we were discussing earlier, why these effects will come through faster, certainly in the worst cases. And I would point you to the several pages, beginning at page 26 in the report, as to why we think that's the case. So, to reiterate, I don't think the scale of the eventual numbers is, is founded on as little data as you suggest. We've got quite a lot for that. Uh, the speed of the adjustment we're less sure about, but we think there are good reasons to imagine it will be slightly faster de on the deintegrating side than when you have trade integration. Okay, uh, Lucy at the front and then Phil for the better. Yeah. Of England effectively endorsing government policy and does that set a risky precedent as some of your colleague, previous former colleagues from the Bank of England are already starting to say that it could set a risky precedent for the independence of the central bank? Well let's, let's um, be clear what's going on here. Um, the, the Bank of England uh, has tremendous responsibilities, has tremendous powers. Um, it is accountable to Parliament, it's accountable to the people of the United Kingdom, it's accountable through Parliament. Parliament has demanded this analysis, right? Now, this is the type of analysis, and as I referenced earlier, we have been doing this type of analysis in order to do our jobs, in order to uh, deliver financial stability, monetary stability, um, and particularly on the former, on financial stability, the type of work to think about exactly what we've just been talking about is what could go wrong, what could be really difficult, where could the financial system be caught out and how well, how can we get it prepared 
so that the financial system is part of the solution, not part of the problem. And the good news is we're here today to reinforce that, and you have, you know, pretty substantial evidence analysis, and in the end, cold, hard capital and liquidity, and if you'd like to hear Sam Woods take up the rest of this press conference by going through the numbers, he'd more than happily uh, do it. Um, in terms of the assessment of uh, a partnership arrangement, um, this is something that we also have to do in order to develop. And this, these are scenarios, not forecasts, and this is, gets to the, one of the links between the two, which is we have to have a sense of the potential implications of a arrangement, an arrangement that's different, after all, than the arrangement we have today with the uh, European Union. And we have to have a sense of what UK businesses and households think about that arrangement, which isn't necessarily the same thing of what that arrangement could or will be. And obviously what financial markets think about it as well. And all of those map into, ultimately, demand, supply, and the exchange rate, and therefore the path of monetary policy. So we have to do it, and the second, and we've done it. And if you have to do it and you've done it, and Parliament demands it, and you're accountable to the people of the United Kingdom through Parliament, you expose it. And that's what's, that's, th there's nothing more here than that. <clears throat> okay, just a reminder, could you mention which organisation you represent as well, please? Um, so, Phil and then James. And then... Yeah, uh, Phil Aldrich at the, at the Times. Um, in your scenario planning, you, uh, the worst case scenario, you, you suggest that interest rates are going to rise to 5.5% as the economy crashes further than it did in the financial crisis. I just wanted to establish how, whether, what, are we looking at theoretical extrapolations or is this realistic that interest rates will do the complete opposite to what happened in the financial crisis? And, so, and what's your estimation of the likelihood of the worst case scenario happening? Okay. Um, so the first thing is, um, in terms of the financial crisis, I think it's, 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 you know, it's a very well structured question. So the complete opposite of what happened in the financial crisis, well in many respects this is the opposite of what happened in the financial crisis because as, as you know Phil, the, um, the financial crisis principally, at least initially, uh, for the first few years was a demand shock. It was a big demand shock. And actually when you look back over the course of our professional lifetimes and stretch further back all the way into the 70s, that is effectively what the collective we have been dealing with, which are demand shocks, um, gradual changes in uh, the supply path of the economy, some com economies doing a little better on productivity, a little more on labor supply, but gradual changes to the supply side of the economy and addressing uh, demand shocks, both positive and negative, and therefore uh, monetary policy can be calibrated to adjust demand accordingly, bring inflation to target or not, if it's miscalibrated, obviously bring inflation to target uh, and support the economy that way. What's different about this is it first and foremost is a supply shock which then has demand implications. So it is a totally different situation than people have been uh, living with and experiencing, certainly in advanced economies. Uh, for the last 30, 40 years. We, in that situation, that's why we've s stressed the supply, demand, and the exchange rate element of, uh, of, of the framework. In that situation, we will, would be faced with a real challenge, uh, and, and to be absolutely clear, uh, which is we know that the direction of the hit to supply, there will be a negative shock to supply, determining exactly how much of it is coming in at what pace and how persistent that is uh, will be difficult and it's part of what Ben was just talking about in terms of do we think it will come in more rapidly than historic integration and if it is a scenario which is unlikely to be absolutely clear but we've got to prepare for the unlikely one and I'll come back to your second part if it is a scenario where there are um, logistical issues and other frictions that are not frictions that are part of the new trading relationship, but are just frictions from adjusting to the new trading relationship, um, we'll have to make a determination about 
how much of the hit to supply is temporary versus persistent. Um, and that will also have a bearing on the, on the stance of policy. Um, but all things equal, um, in a sharp supply shock, um, the role of monetary policy um, is more a sharp supply shock with an exchange rate adjustment, which is driven by future real incomes, with an uh, inflationary effect from tariffs, which we, the last one we largely look through, the first one not necessarily. It's likely to be inflationary. It'll be important. And in the end, we have a remit, um, which is an inflation targeting remit. We can balance that remit to a certain extent, um, but we're not going to ignore it. Um, uh, last point. Uh, in terms of likelihood, you know, I, the, I think when one stacks up worst case, worst case, worst case, um, you know, the joint probability means that it's less likely. The possibility, but it is a possibility that we will have no deal and no transition. We have always thought that it was a possibility, a tail possibility. Maybe the probability has increased with time. You tell me, you're probably closer to it. But um, probability has increased with time. But even when it was just a small probability, our job was to get the system ready uh, to deal with that. Um, and you can't get it ready overnight. We think uh, the system is ready. The, certainly the core of the system is ready now. Um, James at the front. So that is the Governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, with his uh, Brexit uh, assessment, the one that uh, he was stressing the government asked him to carry out uh, with his various scenarios, as he was explaining scenarios, not forecasts, for what could happen in various different Brexit settings. Lots for us to chew over. Of course, we had the government's assessments earlier today. We'll reflect on those in a moment. Our economics correspondent, Andrew Walker, is with me to try and uh, mm -hmm. pick his way through all yes. this. Let, let's concentrate on what the banks say Indeed. first. What do you pick out of all that? Well, the, this was a report with an awful lot of figures in it, but we've selected one or two that uh, I think give some sort of flavour. First of all, let's look at the um, scenario the bank describes as, um, a, as an economic partnership. There are various degrees of closeness one might have in terms of, of keeping the barriers to trade low and this is the range that the bank has come up with for the possible impact on the British economy compared with where it would be um, in 2024 if it stayed on the path it was on before the referendum with 2% growth or so. And I've got a little chart here which basically seems to be suggesting that in that scenario we'd be looking at continued economic growth um, but well, but significantly slower than um, than we had uh, before the before before the referendum. So you know, it, it by no means a catastrophe. I think one one would say. The bank has also been looking, though, at a very, very much more adverse scenario, um, one in which we have a very disruptive Brexit with no transition period. And there's the possibility of seeing um, a cut in the level of economic activity of 8%. Now, that's not compared with, um, with, with some hypothetical path projected from the past, but it's compared with roughly where we are now. And that would be a deep recession, deeper than we saw in the, uh, in the aftermath of the financial crisis. But it's worth emphasising that Mark Carney was saying um, that this is very much a case of preparing for the worst. They've been assessing the banks to see that they can be capable of withstanding this kind of shock, and the conclusion is that they are. He described this as being um, um, an unlikely scenario and the worst case version of it. So. I, as you said yourself, mm. this is not a forecast, and it is important to emphasise that point, just describing what could happen if, I suppose one might say, if everything went yeah, wrong. Uh, and as he says, we are obliged to prepare for the worst, because that's part of what, what, that's what part we're of, there that's, for. That's yeah. part of their job to ensure um, that the banking system in particular can, sure. can, can cope with the worst. So that was what the bank said. Of mm. course, we saw the UK government mm -hmm. and various government figures yeah, outlined sure. earlier this morning. So talk us through those by comparison. Well, those were, there was an, a bit of a difference there in the nature of the exercise. The, the, the bank has been looking at a rather more, more short-term horizon path for how the economy might develop over five years or thereabouts. Whereas the government's forecasts, or uh, scenarios, I should say, <laughs> were looking at how things might look in 15 years' time after the end of the transition period. 
And if we have a, um, the kind of partnership that the, the government would like to achieve, there were a range of forecasts there, a range of possibilities there, the worst of which was a figure of 3.9% compared with where we would be if we stayed um, in, where, or at least where the government's economists think we would be if we were to stay in the EU. They also had a rather more alarming figure for the very disruptive no deal type um, exit from the European Union, and that that is 9.3% below where we would otherwise have been. Now, these figures from the government are not putting out a sort of detailed year-by-year -year path where we can actually see a recession happening um, at, at any point. But nonetheless, that is quite a striking um, difference compared with where the government at least thinks we could be if we maintained current arrangements, as they put it, in other words, remaining in the EU. Okay. Andrew, thank you very much indeed for guiding us through all that. Um, let's get some political response to all that because our chief political correspondent, Vicky Young, is there for us at Westminster. Vicky. Yep, well, a flurry of numbers and uh, analyses today of different Brexit scenarios, as you say, one earlier today from uh, across government departments and now this one from the Governor of the Bank of England. Uh, let's get a media reaction to all of that with the former Brexit Minister David Jones, who joins me now. Um, I appreciate you haven't heard all of Mark Carney, what he's had to say, um, but he has said a disorderly Brexit would trigger the worst recession, a worse recession than the financial crisis if there was no transition deal and it wasn't a managed no deal scenario. What's your reaction to what he's saying? Well, first of all, I think it's very interesting that the Bank of England analysis is published on the same day as the Treasury analysis, both of the same sort of tenor. Uh, the Bank of England won, if anything, more gloomy than the Treasury. Uh, and I think we have to be very careful about these forecasts. Uh, you'll recall that before the referendum, we were told that there would be an immediate recession if the country voted to leave the European Union. We're told that they'd have to be uh, an emergency bud budget and that we would be in a financial crisis and it didn't happen. Now no one is suggesting that there should be a disorderly Brexit so really I think that the more lurid uh, forecast that we see in, in, the, tr in the, uh, the Bank of England's analysis can be discounted immediately but I think beyond that we have to uh, understand that these are uh, analyses uh, that are based upon uh, models and assumptions that are not readily published and I think and in fact I asked in the House only this afternoon that the government should publish its own assumptions so that third-party organizations such as for example economists for free trade can analyze them and can say whether or not they agree with them. Isn't the difference now than we were during the referendum and all these analyses came out is that we are four months from leaving the EU and so understandably businesses whether they are motor manufacturers whether they are farmers whether they are small businesses are extremely concerned because they don't feel ready for a no deal scenario which is what we assume will happen if Theresa May's deal is voted down. Well, th that may, may be the case. Uh, all I would say is that I happen to know that there is a great deal of preparation that has, has gone on uh, for the potential of leaving without a negotiated deal. But I think one has to look at the alternative that is on offer, which is the, the, the government's withdrawal agreement, which would keep us in the customs union uh, forever, unless we were to find a way out of the backstop, which isn't immediately obvious, uh, and would mean that we would be t uh, tied to a declining economic block uh, with a smaller trade, uh, a share of world trade. Uh, so I think we have to look at both of these, these options. I think that nobody wants either extreme. And I think that probably uh, in a fortnight's time, uh, when the government finds that its proposal has been voted down, we will probably see them going back to the EU and trying to arrange something that is more sensible. And what do you think that is likely to be, given the EU has made it very clear that actually this agreement is closed? What do you think, realistically, Theresa May could get out of them if her deal is voted down? Well, well, I think that the EU is saying that it's closed until someone from this country comes back and says it's not acceptable. And I think that that is what is going to be happening in a couple of weeks' time when the House votes it down. And we know that the European Union will agree to a Can Canada-style uh, free trade agreement. That is what I believe we should have been pushing for all along. And given that we are already in complete alignment with the EU, there is no reason why we couldn't agree that free trade agreement uh, within the period that remains to us. Even under that scenario, though, many analyses do say that the country would be worse off than it would be if it stayed in or under Theresa May's deal, because there is inevitably uh, more friction, isn't there, under that scenario, 
if it's non-tariff barriers? Well, we can rule out immediately remaining in the European Union because, of course, the country has voted to leave the European Union. And I think we have to remember also that when it voted to leave the European Union, it wasn't purely on economic grounds. It was on grounds of such issues as sovereignty and independence, which people want to recover. Uh, but I, I, I think that a Canada-style free trade agreement is one that we should be aiming for. Uh, I was at a, a meeting of economists for free trade this morning when it was pointed out that under such a, 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 an arrangement we would actually see uh, economic growth. Uh, and it all depends on the economic assumptions. And the Treasury's assumptions uh, to date have always been very suspect. David Jones, thank you very much indeed. So there will be, of course, endless arguments uh, over the numbers. And of course, Parliament will have its chance to debate this. There will be five days of debate about the deal that Theresa May has got for the meaningful vote. Thank you very much, Vicky. Vicky Young there at Westminster. Well, Theresa May has continued her nationwide tour to sell her Brexit deal. She's uh, made a visit to a factory near Glasgow today. Our Scotland correspondent, Lorna Gordon, is there. So uh, where's she been? What she said, Lorna? Yeah, Julian, uh, Theresa May is still inside this factory in Bridge of Weir, a, a village just outside of Glasgow. She's been there for about an hour and a half, uh, taking her message uh, to uh, the people as it's being built. But it's not exactly a walk through the centre of Glasgow. This is heavily staged, managed. Uh, she was driven from the airport directly here, and one assumes she'll be driven directly back and flown back down to London uh, this evening. Also heavily controlled in terms of the number of media allowed inside. Uh, just a few broadcasters are allowed uh, to ask questions. Uh, a lot of photographers and other media waiting outside. But she did take questions, and her message that she's trying to get out is that she thinks this agreement is, uh, is good for protecting jobs and investment going forward. A free trade area with no tariffs, no fees, that will mean an opportunity to carry on the trade that is so important for companies like Bridge of Weir, where I'm here today, uh, but also gives us the opportunity to negotiate trade deals around the world that will be good for great uh, Scottish exports, like Scotch whisky and Scottish salmon, smoked salmon. Uh, and of course, what I've also seen today is the importance of this deal for employers and organisations across Scotland. Uh, employers like Diageo, uh, the National Farmers Union of, of Scotland and also the Scotch Whisky Association have all said that this is an important deal and have all raised the concerns about the prospect of no deal for Scotland. So this is a deal that is right for Scotland and right for Scottish fishermen. Uh, Lorna, how difficult a sell is this for the Prime Minister given how Scotland voted in the referendum two years ago? Yeah, Scotland, a majority of people here in Scotland voted to remain uh, in the EU referendum. I think uh, that has remained uh, a constant. Of course, uh, the SNP block of MPs say uh, they will vote against this deal. Uh, and while she says this message is aimed at uh, the public, I, I think it's also, to be fair, probably aimed at her own uh, block of 13 Conservative MPs here in Scotland, among whom there is some disquiet uh, about how uh, this deal will eventually shake down when it comes uh, to fishing. To that end, Theresa May uh, released a letter uh, today saying that uh, if no deal, uh, no a good deal was made by the end of 2020, then there would be no access to British waters for EU vessels. She's trying to reassure them uh, with that message and she's trying to reassure the wider public with her message when it comes to the economy. Of course, uh, Nicola Sturgeon would say something entirely different when it comes to the economy. Scotland's First Minister uh, did an interview a little earlier on today when she said, uh, that Theresa May was denying reality by talking about economic opportunity for Scotland when uh, 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 Nicola Sturgeon's own government has published findings that we're going to be, uh, she says, poorer as a result of Brexit. Those figures came out yesterday. Uh, Nicola Sturgeon's advisers modelling uh, that uh, Scots will be £1,600 ahead uh, poorer as a result of Brexit. Lorna, thank you very much for that. Lorna Gordon there, following the Prime Minister in Glasgow. Now, one of the main arguments for leaving the EU has been that it will allow the UK to strike new trade deals with some of our closest allies, including with the United States. However, that hope took a bit of a hit on Tuesday when President Trump said the Brexit deal was great for the EU and he cast doubt on whether the UK would be able to make a trade arrangement with the US. Sounds like a great deal for the EU, and I think we have to do this. 
Uh, I think we have to take a look at seriously whether or not the uh, UK is allowed to trade because, you know, right now, if you look at the deal, they may not be able to trade with us. And that wouldn't be a good thing. I don't think they meant that. I don't think that the prime minister meant that. And hopefully she'll be able to do something about that. But that was the president speaking a few days ago. Joining me is the U.S. ambassador to the U.K., Woody Johnson, who's also been a friend of the president for more than 30 years. Welcome. Thank you. Woody. Great to be here, Julian. Um, <clears throat> let's pick through those comments, first of all. A great deal for the EU, the implication being it's not a great deal for the U.K. Well, I think what he was referring to is the, the, what he's been talking about for the last year and a half, which is a strong, robust, bilateral free trade deal between our two countries. And that's really what he was referring to. And being able to do that, he's talked about saying very, very positive with s such an important trading partner between our two countries. We have you know, about a $250 billion a year in trade and a lot, you know, over a trillion in invested in each other's countries and all this. So it's, it's logical to have one of these agreements. And this would kind of, this has a chance of setting the standard for these free trade agreements around the world where your country could, yeah, can control the, the, the rules and regulation and rules of engagement mm. in a much more positive way. I mean, that might be what he wants and what you want, but he said, uh, going beyond the, the clip I just mentioned, right now, if you look at the deal, the UK may not be able to trade with us. That's what he said. Right. And that's clearly not what Theresa May wants to hear. Well, that's, she said she wants a free trade agreement. She said that all along. That's what she wants, and she has made that point. But the president seems to be implying that the current deal that she is trying so hard to sell to the British people and to Parliament will not enable that to happen. Well, I think there's going to be a delay for sure. And if you've read the, if you've read the agreement, this is a separation agreement, and the trade agreement will follow at some point. And that's the point. Until that point occurs, it's my understanding that a free bilateral trade agreement between these two countries can occur. I may be reading it wrong. You tell me if I'm wrong. No, no, I no. I think you're absolutely right, which is the point I'm getting at. So we might be entering a period where negotiations can take place, assuming we get past March with uh, this withdrawal deal right. agreed upon, Right. but no implementation. Right. Uh, and the president is cognizant of that scenario. I think he is. I think he may. That was the point of what he said. He wants to... He wants to get on with this and get a, a tr free trade agreement as soon as possible, and he's willing to do it and put it right at the front of the schedule. Right. But going back to the great deal for the EU remark, uh, I return to my first observation that that sounded like something that Theresa May would not want to hear. It sounded like the kind of thing that perhaps some of the people she's currently opposed by politically in the UK might say. Uh, I, I don't think he, he meant it that way. He, I think he's, you know, he's a, he's a president. He's, in, he's an executive. He's an impatient to get, you know, on with it and, and to get a, I think he feels that this, this trade agreement, this new kind of trade agreement will be so beneficial in enhancing our both shared security and our shared prosperity that he's anxious to get it done. I think that's what he meant. Let me talk about that possible trade deal, because I know you've written in the Times newspaper today uh, about how you see right. that unfolding. Yes. Give us a vision of how you see that uh, as going forward. Let's say we get to the end of that transition period. So we're talking at the end of 2020. Then how do you see things unfolding? Well, I mean, it, it's, there's a long way between here and there. I mean, it's a, it's a complex negotiation, obviously, to get these things done. But having the president state that he wants to get it done soon and fast and the front of the line indicates that all of the resources of treasury and and trade and commerce and and also the executive branch will be full use we put in on that so i would suspect that it would be done as quicker than than some although he he's done it he did a, a recent trade agreement with you know revising nafta with canada and mexico and that was done reasonably quickly mm. When you talk about the numbers working on it, either in the near future or now, I mean, are there people working on it, on it potentially even now? Even yes. As we speak? Well, yeah, we've got working groups uh, working on it right now. We can't, we can't negotiate now. But just setting up the parameters, what, what could be done, what, are the, what will the issues likely be, what are the ongoing agreements like aviation and 
and uh, defense and sharing um, data and all that, those are being worked on. You talked about soon, front of the line. How soon? Put a, put a figure on it. Well, I think if he was, if the president was in a position to start negotiating one of these, I think it could be very quick. It's hard to know. I mean, we did NAFTA pretty quickly into the new agreement. Um, we have a long-standing relationship with this country. We've been trading for 100 years. So I would think that, uh, you know, we get it done sooner rather than later. Mm. Put a figure on that. I can't put a number on it, but I would say very, very quickly. Right. Uh, I mean, if it's got the pre if it's in the if it's in the Oval Office and if, if it has the executive's signature on it, saying I want this done fast, I suspect it will be done very, very rapidly. So, if we got to the end of December 2020 uh, and we went from negotiation to implementation, we're talking what months potentially? Um, one can't predict those. I mean, I'm not in a position to predict it. But you, you know, I, all I can say is that there's a there's an inclination to do it, um, and uh, the sooner we get it done, the better. The president, of course, is very strong on the phrase that's been much touted by him and his supporters, America first. How will that play a part in his thinking when it comes to negotiations with the UK? Well, I mean, I think the, the president's a good negotiator, but I think that the UK is also a good negotiator, I hope. You've, you've done this for a few years, so I think you know what you're doing. Uh, America first means focusing on America in, in a different way than, than he saw it being focused on. And he was talking about um, a lot of things, but basically maybe the people in the middle part of the country that have been, that have been you know, kind of avoided or forgotten or whatever. But he, uh, he knows that prosperity comes, it has to be shared prosperity. And both countries have to have prosperity in order to have good markets on both sides. So it's shared prosperity, and he understands that, and he supports that 100%. The fear in some quarters here, as you'll be aware, is that America first might mean that come the crunch, given that the American economy is bigger than the UK economy, you hold more of the cards if, for example, you were adamant that certain standards should apply to make a trade agreement work and they aren't currently UK standards, it would be the UK that had to give in. Is that a fair reading of it? No, I don't, I don't think so. No, I, I think that everything, you know, you have to, you, you, I don't think that's a, a useful strategy and a useful proposition going forward. I mean, the same thing will be true between the EU and, and the UK or the, you know, the UK and China or whatever. No, I don't. So I think you have to have fair, free, fair and balanced approach. And that's what the president wants. He doesn't want free trade without fair and balanced trade. So mm. you've got to have the whole gambit and, you know, low, low, reg, you know, lower regulations and more freedom and um, lower tariffs and, and so on. I mean, I ask that, this is a final thought, I ask that perhaps because see, people see how he's currently dealing with China, for example, when it comes to trade. Can the UK expect that sort of treatment in negotiations? Well, I mean, China's a whole different discussion. I mean, if you want to take a look at the China rule book, the rule book that they follow and the rule book that the rest of us have to follow, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's some adjustments that have to be made. And this president is willing to tackle that issue, I mm. think, in a, in a way that others have not been willing to do, politically or operationally. And the world is going to get the benefit of that, I think. But you're confident that the UK will follow the rules? I think we're a rule-based society. And that's one of the great advantages that you have here. You speak the language. You speak English. We speak the same language. You have... Uh, a rule of law, you have great traditions, great regulations, um, you have everything here to be successful. Okay. Ambassador Woody Johnson, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very thank much, you. Chairman. Good evening and welcome to the BBC News at Six. The Bank of England has given a stark warning of the effect on the economy if the UK leaves the European Union without a deal. The bank's forecast is of a shock to growth harder than the financial crisis of 2008, with the economy shrinking by 8%. The governor, Mark Carney, says interest rates would rise and the pound would crash. The warning comes as the government publishes its own economic analysis, suggesting Britain will be poorer under all Brexit scenarios than if it remained in the European Union.
Well, we'll have the latest from Westminster in a moment, but first, here's our economics correspondent, Andy Verity. A resolute mood from the Bank of England's top officials today, determined to issue a stark warning to the public and Parliament that a cliff-edged no-deal Brexit would mean an economy that would be much less open and much more vulnerable. The direction of the effects of a reduction in openness is clear. Lower supply capacity, weaker demand, a lower exchange rate and higher inflation. Here's the bank's analysis of what could happen under different scenarios, rather than a forecast of what will happen. On the current trend within the EU, we'd continue to grow. If we take something like the deal on offer from the government, we'd grow, but by a little less. But if we crash out next March without a deal or a transition period, it says the economy could shrink by 8% within a year. In this worst-case scenario, house prices could fall by 30%, with the pound dropping by as much as 25%, and commercial property nearly halving in value. If it did work out like that, it would be a worse recession than the financial crisis, the sharpest drop in the economy since the Second World War. Their analysis is pretty scary, actually, and they're talking about a very substantial immediate hit uh, to the economy, to unemployment, to house prices, to uh, incomes, uh, because they fear that it would create a lot of economic dislocation. Now, there's a lot of uncertainty around what a no-deal Brexit would look like. Brexit supporters are naturally sceptical of the Bank of England's warning, remembering a time before the 2016 referendum when it warned of the risk of a recession within three months of a vote to leave. Instead, the economy kept growing. These are just Mickey Mouse figures that they throw out there and it's just, I'm afraid, it is the old, it is the old project fear back again to try to scare us witless and I'm afraid we're not going to get scared into giving up this country's democracy by this type of disgraceful behaviour. The Bank of England stresses it's not saying this will happen, just that it might. But if it was doing project fear, it didn't work on the currency markets. There, the pound was up a few minutes ago against both the dollar and the euro. And it seems these warnings are even stronger than those given by the bank before the referendum two plus years ago. That's right, but that action before the referendum is part of the reason that the currency markets aren't taking them that seriously, because there they said there was a risk at least that we might enter a recession, and of course the economy kept growing as I just mentioned there. And actually these warnings are stronger in a way, the warnings of a no deal, no transition, cliff edge Brexit, than the governments were this morning. They were saying 15 years from now, uh, each person would be about £1,100 each worse off. Well, that's not half as bad as saying, for example, that sterling's going to fall by 25%, unemployment rises to 7.5%, inflation is 6.5%, interest rates are up, and we have outflows of people. All those things are what the Bank of England's saying could happen if we get a cliff-edge, no-deal Brexit. But of course, as I mentioned, Brexiteers will be duly sceptical given the Bank of England's relatively patchy record in predicting these things in the past. Mm. OK, Andy, many thanks. Andy Verity there. Well, the government has also released its own economic analysis, which shows the UK will be poorer economically under any form of Brexit compared with staying in the EU. Now, the review suggests that deals similar to the agreement negotiated by Theresa May with Brussels would leave the economy in the next 15 years 3.9% smaller than if the UK stayed in the EU. But if there was no, a no-Brexit deal, the analysis shows the economy, while still growing, would take a 9.3% hit over the same period. Well, our political editor, Laura Koonsberg, has more details. This isn't a general election, even though it looks a bit like it. The Prime Minister's Brexit deal is the candidate. MPs are the voters. She's hopeful the government's numbers today show her compromise is better than nothing. It shows that the deal we've negotiated with the European Union is the best deal available for jobs and the economy that also delivers honours on the, re honors the referendum. There are lots of possibilities that today's statistics just don't and cannot include. But the Brexit campaign certainly didn't say the economy would slow down on the side of a bus. The Chancellor this morning was remarkably clear. If we are only looking at the economic benefits, remaining in the EU um, is a slightly better economic outcome than the Prime Minister's deal. But the Prime Minister's deal uh, gives an outcome remarkably close to the benefits of staying in. It might seem bizarre to hear a Chancellor admit the government's own policy would see the country poorer. But what number 11 is saying today is what most calculations have always said will still grow after Brexit, but a bit more slowly than if we stay in the EU. 
What number 10 is arguing is that under the deal they've brokered, the economy would see much less turmoil and disturbance than if we walked away with no deal and no agreement. But Brexit itself has always been about much more than the cash. There were clear warnings during the referendum about potential costs to the economy. And for Brexiteers, today's numbers need a giant bucket of salt. In a desperate attempt to reverse the result of the 2016 referendum, we're undoubtedly going to hear the most hair-raising stories and improbable forecasts. Let's remind those who might waver that we've heard all this before. Along with those Brexiteers, Labour right now is committed to trying to stop the Prime Minister's deal. Not stopping Brexit, at least not yet. Are they tiptoeing to another referendum? The numbers just aren't there and it's causing insecurity and division unnecessarily. Do you accept though, by voting down the deal, that you will be creating more turmoil, even no. if only in the short no. term? I don't accept that. We want a deal that will protect jobs in the economy. If we can't achieve that, the government can't achieve that, um, we think we can. If the government can't achieve that, we should have a general election. If that's not possible, we'll be calling upon the government then to join us in a public vote. That's the sequence I think that will inevitably go through over this period. So it now, would be inevitable that, that if a vote of no confidence didn't bring down the government and a general election, it is inevitable to use that word that you just used, that's the, it would that's, be another vote. Well, that's right. We've said our policy is if we can't get a general election, well then the other option which we've kept on the table is a, pe a people's vote, a public vote. Nothing seems inevitable around here right now. More than two years since the referendum, getting Parliament and the public on side for any one plan is far from easy. Well, we're going to be talking to Laura in a moment at Westminster, but first let's go to our Scotland editor, Sarah Smith, who's at uh, Holyrood for us. So Sarah, Theresa May, she was in Glasgow today selling her Brexit plans. Given the economic forecast released, um, how well did she go down? Well, the Scottish First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, has just told me that she thinks the Prime Minister is trying to deny reality if she thinks that she can sell this Brexit deal after her own government's figures show that it would leave the country worse off. And the Prime Minister was here in Scotland, of course, to try and deliver a positive economic message, and she said that her deal will protect Scottish jobs and Scottish businesses. But it's clear that the SNP will seize on this economic analysis and a similar one done by the Scottish Government as well to try and persuade other opposition parties to join them in wanting to keep the UK inside the EU single market and customs union which they think would mitigate the economic damage. Okay, Sarah, thank you. Laura, to you at uh, Westminster. Um, how do you think um, the economic analysis from the Bank of England is going to be received where you are? Well, just remember, Clive, the context here. The Prime Minister is desperate to get her deal through Parliament, but right now there are dozens of Tory MPs and all the opposition parties saying they're just gonna let, not going to let that happen. So I think without question, those people on Theresa May's side are going to say, look, if you risk no deal by voting down her plan, just look at my, what, what might happen. There could be enormous economic turmoil. The political reality, though, is many people on the side who hate the deal, who don't want this to happen, will stick their fingers in their ears and say, we've heard this all before. You may find where people are wavering that it could put a few people back into the Prime Minister's column. But this, to many ears, will seem like another episode of the screaming match that has been the Brexit debate for all so, to so long now. Okay, Laura, thank you. Laura Koonsberg there at Westminster. And uh, Sarah, thank you too at Holyrood.